countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Ray Bradbury's Dwellers in Silence. Twenty years had passed. Twenty years since the last of the giant migration ships had crashed to the surface of Mars, bearing its pitiful handful of survivors of the Earth Wars. Twenty years of longing, of turning eyes toward the green Earth as it hung on the horizon like a beckoning light. And now it was done. And the first new ship, built of shining Martian chromaton, had lifted bravely toward home with three men locked in its metal belly. There it is. You can barely see the top of the Atomic Trades building in the twilight. They never finished building. Captain. What is it? Am I going out of my mind? Look, out that way, to the west. Could that be... Oh, heaven, it is. Those are lights. Turn the ship. Full cruising speed. They are lights. Captain, it's a city, a whole blasted city lit up like a Christmas tree. What do you think of your dead planet now, Williams? Decelerate to negative five. We're going to take her down. Unbelievable. We've been walking for hours now and not a soul to be seen. There must be someone. How do you explain the lights? Unless they've been burning like this for 20 years. Ah, impossible. I don't know. Municipal building. Do we have a look here, sir? Possibly the records might contain some. That's a good idea. Keep your weapons ready. We'll start right here with the city clerk's office. Better check radiation again, doctor. Well, not enough to do any damage. creeps, doesn't it? Look at this desk. Papers crumpled, ink stand, just as if somebody came in and worked here every day. Dog licenses, hunting permits. That's strange. Hmm? There's ink in that ink stand. What of it? Well, you'd think standing open for 20 years, it would have dried up. Good heavens. If I hadn't heard it with my own ears, Evans, did that phone ring? Yes. Well? Pick it up, doctor. Hello? Good day, Doctor. How are you? I called to ask some advice about a trepanning problem. Can you tell me if the lateral cut should be made first? Hello? Hello? This is absolutely insane. Hello? Thank you, Doctor. I'll do that. Uh, By the way, how is your wife, Alice? And the girls? And your son, John? Fine boy, John. I'll call again tomorrow. Goodbye, Doctor. Hello? Hello? Gone dead. Who was it? I don't know. Strange voice carried on a conversation about some surgical operation without paying the slightest attention to anything I said. Captain, what is it? Listen. Someone is coming, walking slowly toward the corridor. Coming closer. Jumping Jupiter. It's a man. An old man. Are you... Is it really someone... You seem to be... Real. I saw the ship come down, and I thought perhaps I was losing my mind. It's been so many years. I'm Captain John Parsons. These are my assistants, Dr. Evans and Mr. Williams. We returned to Earth from Mars. Then then it's happened. When we're, we're not alone anymore. Forgive me, gentlemen, if I if I seem moved. I've waited and hoped for so long. You survived the radiation. 
We did. There are others. My family. We are the only ones. I answered the phone a moment ago. Who was it? You heard my voice, Doctor. Yours? Yes. To break the loneliness. I've recorded my voice and rigged up an automatic telephone. It's pleasant to hear the phone ring. I I come here to work. I take it you are a medical man. My name is Cornelius Hathaway. Hathaway? Hathaway the brain surgeon? You know my name. Who doesn't? I watched you on television at college. Why, I saw you 20, 23 years ago. You performed a difficult surgery for a cerebral tumor. Thank you. I'd almost forgotten. My my mind, you see, I... Well, I, I'm almost 80 now. Well, you look fine, sir. We've had the best of everything. An entire city to choose from. Cold storage, the best equipment. But come, come, come. There's a fine dinner waiting for you, and, and you want to meet my family. When I saw the ship come down, I told Alice, my wife, you know, to prepare a feast. This... This is a great day for me, gentlemen. A great, great day. Alice! Alice! Come out to the porch and see who we have here. Alice, you here? Come out! My wife, gentlemen. Alice, Captain Parsons, Dr. Evans, Mr. Williams. How do you do, Hathaway? How do you do? And uh, now, if you will follow me in, gentlemen, we'll meet my children. Lord, what a beautiful woman. She looks no more than 35. Do you suppose the radiation could have done that to her? I don't know. And these are my daughters, Susan and Marguerite, and my son, John. How do you do? How do you do, sir? Sit down, gentlemen, sit down. We'll have a feast in honor of this occasion. Susan, Marguerite, get the best silverware and the damask napkins... And, John, fetch the champagne. Yes, Father. Uh, excuse me a moment, John. Sir? Uh, how old are you? Twenty-three, sir. Thank you. What is it, Captain? Something wrong? Uh, nothing. Except that it's impossible. You see, Dr. Hathaway's son was already in college when I started. That would make him at least forty-five. <laughs> That was a wonderful meal, Mrs. Hathaway. Doctor, your wife is an exceptional woman. Thank you, sir. How would you gentlemen like some fresh gingerbread with your coffee? Hmm? I've uh, baked it this morning. Oh, oh wonderful, wonderful. Hmm, smell that, doctor? It's like coming home, Mrs. Hathaway. <laughs> it's like home having you here. Mrs. Hathaway, may I compliment you on having preserved your youth and beauty so well? Thank you. We have no worries here. No competition. All the things we need for material comfort. Parsons and I were wondering, Dr. Hathaway, if the radioactivity had any effect in preserving tissue. Your children all look so young, too. It is possible, gentlemen, of course. Radiation does strange things to living tissue. Alice, uh, could we have some champagne? Alice. Oh, I'm sorry. If what, John? Uh, some champagne, please. Champagne? Oh, yes, of course. An amazing woman. Did you ever see such grace, such such complete relaxation? It doesn't seem quite natural. I beg your pardon, gentlemen? Uh, Captain Parsons was just about to ask uh, how you and your family managed to escape, Dr. Hathaway. We were very fortunate. You see, my home was in the Sierra Mountains at the time. I had a lead-lined laboratory in the basement where I did X-ray research. My uh, hobby, you know. I chose this house because it was on a hill where I could watch the sky. Oh, the loneliness of those first years. But at least you had your wife and children. Yes, yes, I had my family. If it were not for them, gentlemen, I assure you, I would long ago have put a bullet in my head. Champagne, Captain? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hathaway. May I propose a toast? Oh, let me. Gentlemen, to Earth. To Earth. Earth. May she never be stranger to man. And... Uh, Hathaway, uh, what is it? Are you all right? No, it's nothing. It's nothing, really. Just a, a rather sharp pain in the chest. Why don't you gentlemen go out on the porch and enjoy the air? You've had a long and tiring journey. Alice, we'll show you the way. Will you be all right, John? Yes, don't, don't trouble yourself. I'll see you all in the morning. Good night, Doctor. 
Good night. Come, John. Yes, Father. Well, what do you think of old Mother Earth now, Williams? Ah, smell that summer breeze. Look at that view of the city, lighted up against the sky. It has a certain quality. Well, score one point for the back-to-earth proponents. Uh, I didn't say that. You're beginning to feel it, though, Williams, I can tell. If you don't mind, gentlemen, I'm quite tired. I think I'll turn in. Excuse me? <laughs> well, Captain? Well, what? What do you make of all this? I don't know what you mean. This Hathaway and his family. There's something strange and unnatural going on here. I, I can sense it. Oh, I... I think you're reading things into it, Doctor. Perhaps. Well, I'll turn in, too. Coming? Uh, in a moment. I, uh, I want to smoke a cigarette. It's a very beautiful view, is it not? Oh, I, I didn't hear you come out. How is he? Resting. I've never seen him this bad. Yes, he... Well, he's an old man. I'm sorry, but the, well, the difference in your ages is so apparent. You must have been married very young. You don't know about us, then? No. Perhaps it is better that way. I, I don't follow you. Is it something about your husband? He, he acts very strangely. My husband is a very great man, Captain. It is too bad there was no one to appreciate him. Once he wired the whole city with sound speakers. And when he pressed a button, the whole town lit up and made noises as if 10,000 people were living in it. He must have been very lonesome. Although, with a woman such as you, I don't understand. Perhaps one day you will understand. I hope you will come to trust me as a friend. I can trust no one but him. Good night, Captain. Good night, Mrs. Hathaway. Captain. Hmm? Captain Parsons. Uh, what, what are you doing? Who's there? Dr. Evans. Oh, what's wrong? What, what time is it anyway? 2 a.m. What's wrong? I couldn't sleep. A few minutes ago, I heard someone slip out the front door. In the moonlight, I saw it was the old man. He was headed toward the ship. What are you suggesting, Doctor? Nothing, except that it's fairly unnatural for an old man with a bad heart to go wandering off at 2 in the morning. Very well. We'll follow him. <laughs> This is far enough. What do you suppose he's doing? What are those on the ground? Good Lord, those, those are grave markers. Four of them. You're right. He seems to be praying over them. Listen. Do you forgive me for what I had done? I had to do it. I was so lonely. So terribly lonely. You don't mind too much? You do forgive me, don't you? Yes. Yes, I feel you do. Well, I'm glad. I think perhaps I can rest now. I think I... Oh. Oh. He's having another attack. Come on. <coughs> Hathaway. Dr. Hathaway, can you hear me? Raise his head, Evans. <coughs> Dr. Hathaway. His lips are moving. What is it, Doctor? Closer. Lean closer. I... I'm sorry I had to spoil all of this. I've expected it for some time. We'll fix you up. No. No, I'm an excellent diagnostician. It really doesn't matter. Except for them. What about them, Hathaway? You suspected, didn't you? Yes, I suspected. But I, I couldn't believe it until now. Do they know? No. No, they, they wouldn't understand. I wouldn't want them to know. Ever. Doctor? He's dead, Captain. What was it he meant about your suspecting? Light a match, Dr. Evans. Look on those four grave markers and tell me what you see. Good heaven. Well? Alice Hathaway, Marguerite Hathaway, Susan Hathaway, John Hathaway, died July 1987. 
But that 20 years ago. It's impossible. If these markers are correct, then who are those others? Can't you guess, Doctor? Can't you guess? I'm sorry, Mrs. Hathaway. He didn't want us to feel badly. He told us it would happen one day and that he didn't want us to cry. He didn't teach us how, you know. He said it was the worst thing that could happen, to know how to be lonely and unhappy. We weren't to know what death is. Perhaps it's just as well. You know about us, don't you? Yes, I know. I didn't think you knew yourself. The children don't. I have been aware for a long while. No one would have guessed. You're so perfect. He would have liked to hear you say that. He was so very proud of us. After a while, he came to love us. And at the end, he took us as his real wife and children. He even forgot sometimes that he had made us. You gave him a great deal of comfort. Yes. Over the years, we sat and talked. He loved so much to talk. I was first, you know. Then he became lonesome for the children, and so he made them. There was only one thing, one flaw. And that? He couldn't make us grow old. And so he had to watch himself become an old, old man while we stayed young. It was a great blow to him. We'll bury him on the hillside where the other four crosses are. I think he would like that. Yes. He would. Mrs. Hathaway, Alice, I think that you are a very great and wonderful woman. And so we commend the body of this man, John Hathaway, to his maker. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust returneth. Amen. Come, John. Yes, Mother. Susan. Marjorie? Uh, Evans, Williams, uh, stay here a moment, please. What is it? Let them go back to the house. I, I want to speak to you. I know what you're going to tell us, Captain. I saw the names on the grave markers. Well? It's a mockery, a blasphemy of everything we believe in. For a man to do something so evil. Can't you imagine what he faced? Can't you imagine what it must have been like to have watched his wife and children die slowly of radiation burns? To know that he was the last man on the face of the earth. Alone, eternally and unalterably alone. Good Lord, man, what would you have done if you'd had his medical and, and technical genius? I'll tell you, you'd have come back to your laboratory just as he did and, and tried to recapture all the wonderful things that they had been to you. You'd use all the power of your memory, all the, the accuracy of your fingers, and you'd try to put together, bit by bit, all those things that were wife, son, and daughter. It's incredible. So you suggest that we take them back, Captain? I, I don't know. We... We haven't enough space in the ship for that. Every ounce counts. Still, to, to leave them here like that, alone... I think I have an answer, cold-blooded as it may seem. Go on. I suggest that we turn them off. Do you think I could do that? No, but I think I could. After all, they aren't human. They're worse than robots. They're ghoulish. I suggest you go back to the ship, Captain, and leave me to deal with them. I will not permit it. You've no choice in the matter. I assure you, it'll be quick and entirely painless. I hate to admit it, but he's right, Captain. We can't take them with us, and it would be less than human to leave them here without Hathaway. They were created by him for himself. They have no other feelings, no other purpose. If you leave them, they'll go on year after year, night after night, talking, laughing, baking strawberry biscuits, for no reason, not knowing who they are, why they exist. Could you do it, Doctor? I don't know. I've already offered to do it. No. No, I, I wouldn't want it to be you, Williams. You're, you're sick. You have no feeling. If Dr. Evans here can do it, well, so be it. It's a difficult thing, Captain. Still, as you say, they aren't... They aren't human. Logic is on your side. It isn't as if you were murdering someone. Well... Give me the blast gun, William. We'll wait in the ship. Take off in half an hour. Half an hour. Say, 
625. You should be back soon. Yes. He's doing the only humane thing, Captain. They're less than human. Are they? Well, it's done now. No one will ever... That's the airlock. He's back. Well, here's your gun. Did you do it? When I entered the house, one of the daughters looked up at me, and she smiled. The others smiled. He taught them that, taught them to make him feel welcome when he came home at night. I knew that, and yet... Well, I should have done it then. I might have, but she came in. The wife. She said something about sitting down for a cup of tea. She looked at me with those fine, intelligent eyes. I couldn't do it. It would be murder. Cold-blooded murder. I prayed you wouldn't be able to do it. There will never be anything as fine as they are, you know. Built to last a hundred, two hundred, perhaps a thousand years. Well, get the course in the integrator, Williams. We'll take off in 20 minutes. I should be back by then. You're going out, sir? I'm going to say goodbye. You've come back. Only to say goodbye. It was nice of you. I wanted you to know that I'm coming back. Here? To us? Here. To you. I... I believe you. I never meant anything more. When will you come? I don't know. It'll take many years to prepare fuel for another trip. Six, seven, perhaps ten years. I will watch the sky at night. Just as... He watched it. I'm not a young man. Time is nothing to me. I was born out of time. I'm afraid I must go now. I understand. Strange. I have a new feeling. One which he didn't teach us. A feeling of... of longing. Of sadness. That one is not taught. It comes of being alive. Yes. I am alive. Even though he created me. I'm a person now. Goodbye, Alice Hathaway. Goodbye, John Parsons. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Dwellers in Silence, written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Anne Seymour, Carl Weber, Theodore Osborne, Richard Hamilton, Edwin Jerome, and Stan Early. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Don't forget, next week, X-1 will be heard on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 